Thanks, Anastasia, and thanks everyone for joining us again. Um, we're really pleased um, for our March webinar that we're joined by Laurie and Andreas, um, who are going to be talking to us about how we can communicate um, best um, with clinicians and uh, patients. Um, so over to Laurie, thank you. So, hello, hopefully there are people here now. So I'm going to talk to you about communicating with clinicians and the front end users of the healthcare systems to try and improve the data quality that is going into the system and then a bit about the low level requests that come in from teams etc. So as a brief introduction I work for the clinical development unit the data science bit at Nottinghamshire Healthcare NHS Foundation Trust and we cover mental health services, forensics, offender health and community services so quite a diverse trust and specifically I am a clinical analyst and while I primarily work with liaison psychiatry which are the mental health teams that are in A&E and the acute hospitals I have recently been starting to do data clinics which involves supporting more teams in collecting better data getting away from spreadsheets and trying to improve their understanding of the data so that it's collected better and benefits everybody so when we're talking about data, I think it's always good to appreciate the journey that the data goes on. And quite often this data does start with a person and often a person that's not in the best place because they will have been, they'll be quite poorly. And analysts, as analysts, we tend to focus on just extracting the data from the database, analyzing it as per the requirements of whatever the current request is, and then submitting that answer to someone. But the data has gone on a longer journey before it even gets to the database and we also need to be mindful about where it's going after because quite often data is used to affect change or for continued monitoring which is why being accurate and everybody understanding what it means is important and that also comes from the context. So the place to start is always with the clinicians or the admin who are inputting the data into the system because they are the ones that control what data you are seeing. And it's whatever they understand the data to mean that gets recorded. So it is always important to know to see what their understanding is because their understanding may not be the same as yours, which would very quickly make any analysis fall apart. And to try and improve the collection, it's always good to talk to them about why the data is helpful. Quite often clinicians especially just want to get back to their face time with the patients. That is what they became a doctor, nurse, psychologist, therapist, OT, whatever for. And so if they can understand why the data is beneficial to them and to the patients in the wider service, again, that becomes quite an important tool. You also need to look at where the challenges are in recording the data. If someone is having to input the data three times in three systems, yeah, they're going to get bored. They're going to not necessarily record it accurately everywhere. Is it got a drop down list that doesn't seem very appropriate because at the end of the day people do want to record accurate data and when there isn't the means to do it because the drop down options aren't appropriate they don't reflect the patient again you're going to find very little desire to fill it in properly they're going to tick whatever it is that gets them back to their patient so you need to leave some time to build this relationship because a lot of the time data is used to tell clinicians they're not doing a good enough job. They've not done enough assessments. They've not done enough of this. There's not enough of this going on. So they can be wary of people that are trying to talk about data to them. So it's about leaving time and little things can make a massive difference. Just popping in saying hello, letting people come to you. Because again, if this is a forced relationship, it doesn't always go very well. So letting people know when you're going to be in the office when they can come to you remind them of your email address all these little things do start warming them up to you because again most of them most clinicians have actually met an analyst are a bit of a weird breed to them so by doing this we've encountered a few different things and these are a few examples of data challenges that i've found that taught me a lot about communicating with the clinicians so the first one is in our data system, which is known as Rio, there is a box called first language. And now most, most of you will probably be thinking, oh, OK, I know what that means. However, we soon found that there were two different interpretations for this. And so where we've got adult specialties and older adult specialties, they'd actually taken different interpretations. So first language can either be interpreted as primary communication language or it can be interpreted as mother tongue. So 
if I pick on my mother for this, because I can, my mother is Spanish. And so her mother tongue is Spanish. She grew up there and came here a few decades ago. But actually, when she's in the UK and would go, and if she was to go to the hospital, her primary communication language would be English. She speaks very good English. There's nothing wrong with it. So if she was to an adult team, they'd likely just write the English down because they tend to adopt the primary communication language interpretation of this field. Comparatively, older adults, and especially within mental health, because they're dealing with a lot of patients with dementia and delirium, they tend to document mother tongue because there is a lot of language regression that can occur. And so even though they had a patient, one of the consultants was telling me who was in his 70s. He'd lived in the UK since he was 10 after coming here from Germany. So his mother tongue was German, but had learned English. They actually documented his German because whenever there would be a complication with his dementia because he'd got physically poorly or whatever, he would revert back to German. So that knowledge that he could revert to German was very important. So the same with my mother, even if she was speaking English in that moment, they made an older adult team may choose to document the Spanish that so they are prepared for every eventuality. And of course, with these both being in the same field, it does make for messy data. Uh, but by speaking to the people that are inputting this data, it did allow us to be able to just separate the two sections off. So when we want to know about people's primary communication language, we tend to just look at the adult data. And if we want to understand more about mother tongue, we can look at the older adult data. And it explained a lot because it was about 3% non-English for adults and 20% for older adults. And again, that just took a couple of little questions and asking the clinicians and they're more, quite often you'll find they're more than happy to answer these sort of questions. The next challenge came with marital status. This is something that we do like to collect from a lot of people. But we were finding that it was being filled in very weirdly. And it's because it, for most clinicians, it was being duplicated. They would write about someone's marital status in their progress notes. Again, with these being mental health teams, they would write about patient is going through a breakup or is getting divorced or is going to get married. The data was already there. It was already accessible to them. Why would they then go to this other random part of the system to document it again? So quite often it was being filled in initially because someone would come and go, why have you not filled it in? But there was no method of tracking updates or tracking to remind people, has this changed? Has this been updated? Because none of the clinicians really knew why we needed it there when they could already see it in the progress notes. And so again, that isn't that this data is not being collected. It's not that people didn't appreciate its importance, but it's about why it needed to be there twice. Of course, a lot of things. So actually marital status is not something that I use with some of my teams because we've not found a way to put it in yet. And the final one was referral reason. This was part of the MHSDS, which some of you may have encountered, which is the mental health services data set. And for liaison teams, crisis teams and inpatient teams, we have to write why the patient was referred. And so we got this list, which was nationally mandated. And the teams went, we hate it. It doesn't represent our patients. We're not going to touch it. And to be honest, I couldn't really blame them. There was almost nothing for older adults. The only thing there was organic brain disorder. But that then meant them having to put in dementia and delirium as the same option, which to them they're like, these are very different patients. They're not the same thing. We don't want to categorise them. And even within adults, we were having to put things like psychosis and suicide attempt as the same option. And the clinicians didn't agree that they were the same option. So we're very reluctant to fill it in. So we worked with the system and went back and managed to find a way to add the options on our instance of the system, but it still feeds back to the national team as needed. And this jumped our compliance initially from 3% to 60%. And that was just because it represented them. And although someone had said, well, why would you want a longer list? Wouldn't that make it harder? Again, people do want to record accurate data. And so when given the means to do it in a useful way, they will. We then talked about the benefits and went, well, if we can compare a referral reason to the actual challenge faced by the patient, this could inform a lot of our training. If some of the acute wards are misidentifying psychosis for depression or vice versa, this would allow us to see it because we've now got a referral reason and an assessment challenge. And that again got our compliance most of the way. And I'll be honest, the rest of the compliance came from bribery and chocolate because we had to get to 95% for the sequin that year. It's fine. I didn't mind spending a little bit on chocolate. 
when all the teams got to their 95% compliance. So now we need to think about the data requester and Andres is going to talk more about the senior managers and complex things. But quite often we get lots of little tasks. So one of the first things to look at is consistency. So if this is something they're going to want monthly to make sure that it looks right, and I'll come on to data literacy and an example in a second. But it's also worth trying to find out more about why they're asking the question. A lot of clinicians won't necessarily know how to ask the question. They may not know what data is available. We've got such massive data sets with the NHS. It's not always possible. So again, someone came and asked the question, how many admissions occurred last month? Which is a reasonable question. In theory, it's got a nice simple answer. That month it was seven. Fine. But what does that actually get anyone? So again, we I probed a bit further and went, why do you want to know last month how many there were? And then it turns out that they wanted to know how many people were already known that then got admitted that potentially could have avoided A&E. And we so, said, oh, OK, well, actually, I can tell you what how many were open to another team. Would that be more helpful? And it, they just hadn't realised that it didn't, that that was possible to do. So quite often people will ask a question with the best intentions, but when you start asking why do they want it, you'll get a lot more of the story and within two or three minutes you can get a much better answer for them, which makes them very happy and more likely to come back and we want people to be curious about this data. But equally it makes it worthwhile because if I'd given seven and that had not been really what they'd wanted but they'd not understood, that would have been a waste of both of our times. And then we've also got this thing about if you answer the question badly. So again, if they'd actually meant acute admissions, because that's what they work with and we'd given psychiatric, the numbers could have been horribly wrong. So I'm hoping technology works for me. I'm going to jump and also see what do they want from it? Because again, we want clinicians to be engaged with the data because it gives them a sense of ownership. It means that they're more likely to fill it in. So I'm going to show something that I've built and most of this is a nice simple bit of R code to make the DT table. But there were a couple of teeny little tweaks that actually went from them looking at this once and never again to this being a really key part of what they do each week. So, please work. Here we go. This is my lovely DT table with jibber jabber names so that that when this was initially built, there were no colours and no patient name. Just a client ID because again, as analysts, we don't normally look at what a patient's name is because it doesn't matter so someone is called John Paul Sebastian or anything because actually in the data it's not relevant but when the field was missing which was very easy to add from an analyst point of view the team didn't recognize the client IDs it meant nothing to them they couldn't respond to it very well and then they liked the colors I know that RAG ratings have got lots of issues from an analytical point of view in reporting, which we won't go down that rabbit hole right now, but people do respond well to colours. So it suited them perfectly to have these colours for the alert system to see the complete and overdue. And they also liked being able to filter. So this in this jibber jabber, if this was, I don't know, let's call this person Ryan, they can now filter to just theirs and see the status of their patients. And that was really useful. And again, most of this was a very simple piece of R code, which I'm happy to share with anyone. But those tiny little tweaks suddenly meant that this became a very important and they're now completing more of their PROMs, the so patient reported outcome measures, which then gives us more data. And we go from there. Let's see if I can jump back to this. Oh, crap. I knew something was going to go wrong. There we go. So by understanding what they wanted to do with it, and again, this monitoring, that table became very useful very quickly. And the final thing with this is the data literacy. Most of us can't remember what it's like to not be able to read. And reading graphs is a similar skill to reading words that once you're able to do it, it's very hard to look at a graph and imagine to not be able to. In the same way, it's very hard to look at words like on this slide and imagine what it's like to not be able to understand them. So this is a load of fake data and obviously you guys can't talk to me back. You can all sort of look at this and sort of go okay and think and as people that are more 
data literate, which take a guess whether there is one or four teams being demonstrated here. And when I've shown this to a few other people before, they've always been quite shocked. This is only one team that is being demonstrated in these four graphs. But this is where consistency and data literacy are so important. Because if it takes an analyst more than 10 seconds to realise that this is one team's data being represented in four quite different ways, people that are less data literate don't stand a chance. And so they will stop wanting to engage with the data or they'll start making incorrect assumptions. And this is where, again, difficulty the, or the reminder that our data is quite often being used for something else. Sometimes it is just for patient's knowledge. But last thing you'd want is someone in that's doing performance measuring to misunderstand this, think the team is suddenly doing really, really well or really, really badly because it will all fall apart. It can affect funding and everything. So that's why within our things like GREP, which is in BASAR, or case when, which is the tidyverse version, allow you to maintain consistency in the data and the numbers that you produce. But then there's so by using things like the R markdown, which produced the thing I had up, allows it to rerun just this, exactly the same every time. So whatever graph settings you've got will be maintained. And so once the clinician, front end user, manager understands it, they can engage with it a lot more because quite often these people do not have a lot of time. And so if it, it's going to take them an hour and a half every month to understand this one graph because it looks different every month, they're not going to engage very long but they're more happy to put the time in if it's then going to make it simple each way. So final few little messages for everyone is the first is said don't make assumptions. Like we said with first language, it was very easy to assume that interpretation you had was the correct one when actually there were multiple ones. One of my little tips for making friends with the clinicians is to try and fix an issue. Even if it is something seemingly trivial, like adding in an extra option on a drop down, like making something that little bit easier for them to do on the data system. It really does improve the trust that they've got in you and also helps build that relationship both ways, because if you're lo seem lo looking like you're trying to help them, which we should be trying to do, they're more likely to then be willing to work with you to help it. And quite often that's it. This is a very hard relationship to force to just sit down and go, right, I want to talk to you about data now need to let people come to you but you'd be surprised that with a little bit of time they will and these relationships will make any analysis you do significantly better because if you've got the wrong understanding of the data going in it doesn't matter how good the analysis is that is being performed it's going to always come out a little bit squiffy and that is me I think, uh, I think I'm handing over to Andreas now. Ah, OK, thanks. So if you can just let me know um, if you can see, I'm, I'm going to switch to a, a presenter mode and I just want to see uh, if you, can you see my notes or you can only see my slide. I'm just your slide. slide. OK, perfect. Thank you very much. So I'm Andreas Soteriades. I'm a data scientist in the CDU data science team at Nottinghamshire. Healthcare NHS Foundation Trust. I'm uh, working with Lori among uh, among other uh, 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 very highly skilled data scientists. So uh, today I'm also going to be talking about communicating analysis with clinicians and managers and actually I'm focusing on the manager side. So the idea of this presentation is to um, uh, to just show you a few example examples from my own experience of how I um, try to engage with people who do not necessarily have the machine learning background, but that it was very important for them to to understand why machine learning was uh, solving uh, big, you know, critical business uh, uh, problems, and you know why why it was a um, a good idea to to do further uh, machine learning and data science. Um, this is also particularly important in healthcare because machine learning, machine learning is uh, is really exploding, um, especially text mining and natural language processing. Because if you think about it, imagine having patient feedback or I don't know doctors' reports or you know other types of of uh, free text where people are uh, expressing uh, you know are either um, reporting something on a patient or expressing um, 
uh, I don't know, something uh, bad about uh, the services which we could, uh, you know, uh, use to improve services. Uh, you understand why text mining and na na natural language processing can be so important? Because when you have thousands of these texts, you need a machine to at least um, take some of the work off people's shoulders who, who actually read all, all those texts and try to uh, improve healthcare based on, on what they say. Uh, I have some examples here, just for you, you know, the, the underlined uh, sentences are actually, they're actually links, so you can take a look for yourselves. I think that the, the first and the second link are, are, will provide you with a very good overview of uh, what others have done. Uh, and uh, the third link is our, our very own project that we are also developing a machine learning solution that is also uh, combined with an interactive dashboard to help people to, you know, see instead of seeing the machine learning resu results themselves or the text mining results themselves, they see something that is more easy for them to understand so they can use it uh, for decision making. Uh, just wanted to say that because we are halfway in terms of time frame, uh, the link to our project is is more um, uh, for people who understand the technology and who use Git. So uh, the rest, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, but <laughs> you need to wait a bit. Uh, we are working full time on it. It will be uh, ready sooner than later, but it's still under development. Um, so now uh, coming back to to machine learning, uh, machine learning is often seen as a black box. I mean, the methods, the models, everything that has to do with it are quite uh, complicated. So it, it might it, sometimes it's difficult to communicate uh, uh, concepts and uh, and processes uh, to to uh, to managers. Uh, data science teams are not really necessary in organization. We're more of a luxury. You know, one organ an organization could keep doing uh, business as usual uh, with or without us. So here, the what is key is to be able to explain, engage with the, with uh, decision makers and show them, you know, demonstrate them hands on uh, why machine learning can be, uh, you know, can help so much an organization to uh, be more efficient and uh, respond faster to uh, to any issues. Um, so now going to the examples of, uh, you know, that I have used in the past in, in presentations and in meetings with, uh, with managers and people, I would like to begin with this one, which is a rapid intro to, to machine learning. So I was in a situation where there were, we, were, we were a new team, lots of people didn't know, they had a clue, they have a clue what machine learning was. To give you an example, a colleague of mine thought that it was something about computers and working in a bank, but some sort of office based job where you're in a bank and you're using a computer, but who, God, who, who knows, God knows so what she thought that you were, were supposed to be doing the computer or whatever. So, and to begin with, I wasn't working for a bank. I mean, she was a colleague in another organization. So, you know, this actually uh, was like, you know, to me it was an indication that I needed to be very, very super engaging and uh, depart from many technical terms and speak in a language that people uh, understand or identify with in order to, uh, yes, to at least um, help them understand what we were up to. Uh, so I used this, uh, um, this toy, which I think is called shape sorting cube or something like that. At least um, I'm going to call it shape sorting, shape sorting cube for this, for the purposes of this presentation. So. Uh, for those who know machine learning, there are two types. Uh, broadly speaking, you have supervised and unsupervised. So uh, I wanted to first explain what supervised machine learning is. And I said, OK, consider that we have a child. So that's a, our learner who is learning how to, you know, to pass the different uh, shapes through the, the uh, you know, different holes. So what do, what do they do? They, they try out different shapes. Some of them fit, some of them do, don't. And through this uh, process of uh, trial and error, in the end, they they learn. So when they see a shape, they can in a way predict uh, which hole it, it, it should pass through. So this is the supervised learning uh, uh, aspect of machine learning that you are giving what you have, you're, you're learning based on what you have and you're trying to predict then what, what the actions would be. Um, when when you don't know the answers. So consider, for example, I don't know, um, 
a CQC rating. So uh, a machine learning algorithm, a learner, the algorithm in this case, that would be learning from uh, uh, previous reports, CQC reports, and be able to predict if uh, uh, a healthcare provider is going to decline or not in the next, next inspection, you know, something like that. Uh, in terms of unsupervised learning, which is uh, the so-called clustering, you can use the same uh, figure, the shape uh, sorting cube, to say, okay, the child may notice that there are different colors or different shapes, and they could, uh, you know, just for fun, organize, group those different, uh, you know, these different pieces, uh, either by color or by shape. So, what do they do? They are identifying patterns, and they identify, identifying color patterns or shape uh, patterns, and they're, um, uh, you know, uh, grouping them accordingly. So this is what unsupervised learning does, that, that you don't really know the answers, but in a way you're trying to sort them out uh, based on some common uh, characteristics that your data may have. Now, uh, explaining machine learning uh, models to the lay audience. So for example, explaining a random forest, which is something that we used in a project uh, in a previous role of mine and uh, a, a, a colleague of mine was struggling to explain random forest to to top management. And uh, so I think that if you ask me, do I really need to explain it on the forest? Will it make a difference to top management? Do they really need to know? What they need to know is perhaps some more intuitive stuff, you know, the more basic stuff about how it works, you know, as intuitive as regression is uh, normally for top management. If, if top management is a little bit, you know, quantitative, has a little bit of quantitative background, they know what regression is and how it works. Uh, it's simple and intuitive uh, in a similar manner uh, decision trees are simple and intuitive it's just you know um like when we're making decisions in our own in our own life if it's got if it's raining tomorrow i won't play tennis if it isn't i will but if it's humid uh, i won't blah 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 you know it really depends on uh, uh, on you know on different if else decisions if you like so once you have explained decision trees I don't think there is, uh, if you ask me, I don't think there is a, a reason uh, to uh, actually explain random forest. That's where people actually will get completely lost and it doesn't really matter. I mean, as soon as, as long as they understand the fundamentals so they can be on board and follow what you're talking about, the rest, which you can just leave it. Uh, now, another example, class balancing. Uh, there was a logistic regression model that could give great results for one class and very bad results for another class, which is a kind of a standard uh, modeling problem. And uh, one class had uh, a lot of uh, uh, records, the other one had very few. So it was very difficult for people to, to understand what, what on earth do we do here? I mean, why is this model not working? How do we fix it? So uh, looking at it from the more you know machine learning side of things, I thought, well, I said, okay, let's do class balancing which means that in a way you're bringing the majority class, the one that has a lot of records, and the minority class, the one that has very few records, in a way you balance them so that they more or less have uh, the same uh, number of, of records, so that the, the learner will then uh, um, have more number of records from the minority class to, to learn from. Okay, so how do you communicate this in the least technical way possible? Actually, no technical, no technical uh, terms at all. Again, consider a child that you, we are uh, teaching, them, teaching them how to identify different animals. So we show them lots of photos of cats and just a couple of photo, photos of tigers. So then you, then you show them a new photo of a tiger and uh, the, the child is very likely to say, hey, this is a cat, you know, or a massive cat, you know, but still a cat, not a tiger. And that's because they look similar and the child hasn't had enough information, enough photos to, to be able to properly identify, distinguish between cats and tigers. So what do you do? You can down balance, which means you give them, you, you give the learner less photos of cats and uh, so that they become say more or less equal to the numbers, uh, to the number of photos of tigers. So you're, you know, you're teaching them to, in a way you're helping them to using this more balanced data set to distinguish, to properly distinguish a tiger from a, from a cat. And it looks the other, it works the other way around. You give more instances, more photos of tigers, then you're balancing your data set, you're balancing your number of photos, 
and the child uh, learns to identify a tiger properly. Uh, another example from uh, a meeting where I was uh, working with a team that uh, we, we also had some external partners who were developing a machine learning solution for us. And uh, I was part of the handover, like the, the technical guy of the handover. And we had, I had with me, I, I went with, with another couple of colleagues who were, had nothing to do at all with uh, quantitative analysis. And uh, at some point, the consultants, the, the people who were the external partners, started talking about, you know, they started delving into the more technical stuff and talking about hyperparameter tuning and how their interface tunes different parameters of the models, blah, blah, blah. So uh, my colleagues, uh, they had, I saw their face and it was a face of uh, despair. I mean, they were just completely confused and they they had no idea what, what the, the consultants were talking about. Uh, so I said, okay, let's look at it from a different viewpoint. Uh, you have a model, in this case it's a stereo, and you want to find the optimal uh, settings for your bass and treble so that uh, your album, you know, your music sounds great, right? So you play a Madonna CD, uh, you find the optimal settings, bass and treble, and then you say, okay, that sounds fine, let's play a Rolling Stone CD, and it sounds awful because you have, in a way, you have tuned your model to um, to perform well in for pop music, but not necessarily for any other kind of music. So in this case, you want your model, the hyperparameters of your model, which is bass and treble in this sense, to be more, uh, in, in a way, to generalize better, uh, to put it very roughly. So what do you do? you try out different uh, albums from different kinds of music. Let's look at it as different data sets, let's say, or you're, you know, you're chopping and dicing your data set in a different way and you're feeding your, your model with it. So in this case, you're, you put some, uh, some Beatles, some Madonna, some uh, Miles Davis, and, uh, and you, you try out different hyperparameter or different bass and treble, uh, uh, you know, uh, settings and you find like some sort of optimal combination of them where whatever you play after that, you know, a new album that you play uh, will sound great. So other ideas about hyperparameter tuning. Let's consider that we have a car, okay? This is our model and we want the car to, to run as, as efficiently as possible. So this is like, I know, trying to optimize, it, to optimize a classifier or something. Uh, and so what do we do? We try different types of petrol, our hyperparameters in this case, and we, we find the one that uh, makes our car run more efficiently. Or you can see it as a, a builder's problem. You have different builders with different skills and they use different tools. In this case, the skills and the tools or the combination of skills and tools are the hyperparameters. And, uh, you know, you, you they, they will perform differently in terms of, of building the, the perfect loft. So, you know, in, in the way you're trying to find the builder that has the, the, the perfect combination of skills and tools to, to build you the perfect uh, loft. Um, something else that is very important. I think it's really important to involve top, ma top management in modeling processes. So, unless top management really has a, is more confident in what you're trying to do th with machine learning and I, un at, unless they have a more hands-on uh, experience with it, uh, it may be very difficult to convince them why machine learning can be so invaluable in an uh, org organization. Uh, and in this case, in, in the project, I used cost-sensitive cost learning, uh, which is a way to uh, allow managers to uh, to give access to managers to try out different scenarios. You know, when managers are thinking about resources and planning and what's prioritizing, you know, they're thinking of different scenarios. If they're also a little bit confident with Excel, they may be trying out different scenarios on Excel, uh, you know. So it, in a similar manner, you can do the same uh, with machine learning. So uh, what is cost sensitive learning? It's a way of optimizing a, a classifier by telling it uh, what the cost or benefit would be of correctly classifying or misclassifying different classes. So consider, for example, this uh, 
uh, example from a bank. So a fraudulent, a fraudulent transaction, if it's refused, uh, there is a non-trivial benefit, okay? But if it's legitimate and it's refused, then it has a non-trivial cost because it annoys the customer. But if it's fraudulent and it's approved, then the, the loss can be quite significant because if we're talking about uh, thousands or hundreds of thousands of pounds, all of these hundreds of thousands of pounds will be lost. So this is the cost in this case. And if it's legitimate and approved, then there is again, there is a benefit that is proportional to, to the, the amount of the transaction. So uh, even though it wasn't necessarily the, the best possible model, probably we would have managed to increase uh, accuracy uh, using another model, uh, we thought, well, okay, this at least helps managers to uh, have a mo more hands-on experience and be more engaged, more involved in the whole process and see the value of machine learning and uh, use it in their work. Not, not directly, of course. I mean, you know, we were the practitioners, we were the ones who were running the models, but at least they had the say. Uh, so just to summarize, I think it's, it's not at all necessary to talk about models and methods in details. I mean, people will just get frustrated if they don't, especially if they, if they are not uh, uh, interested in, in mathematics or data science. You know, it's only fair. So you don't really need to talk, talk about models and methods if you want to, to even if you want to convince them that uh, data science and machine learning can, can bring a big benefit to the organization. So the point is that you, you want top management to see the value of, of machine learning in decision making and actually you want to to spread this message across the whole organization uh, regardless of uh, uh, whether a person is a manager or not you know to be for the people to be more engaged and better understand uh, how machine learning contributes uh, use language that is relevant to the audience people stuff that people identify with stuff that people understand you know simple examples uh, you know, we're using the cars or the builders or the children that, uh, that I mentioned before, you know, really simple examples. Um, and yes, last but not least, to uh, if you can involve top management in the model building process, at least, you know, uh, uh, allow them to have a say. And if they have a say, then you can, in a more uh, interactive and collaborative manner, you can uh, uh, demonstrate the potential and get some really good results that are invaluable to the organization. And uh, that's me. Thanks very much for listening. Check out our blog. Uh, and yes, thank you again. Thank you, Andres. Um, Beth, would you mind looking through questions, please? Yes, no problem. Thanks both. That was a very, very good session. Um, Checking for any questions that have come through. Well, we got good feedback from Gary that he'll be using it in his tiny model session. Um, yeah, and if there are any other questions, please do. Um, uh, post them in the Q&A box before it's too late. I think there is a question to Laurie actually because it was um, it came through at 1.34. Um, oh. oh, about uh, RAC, yeah. Um, when people start using uh, it for percentages, you get an MS where 75% is orange and 76% is green. Mm. Yeah, it's definitely a challenge because I mean, even in that table, it is a bit arbitrary because technically at 89 days it's orange and it goes to red at 90 but that's just I think on a team level it can work I think it's when it's a performance measure and they just look at orange to green and not the numbers underneath it that can be a bit more of a problem for everyone oh thank you um Laurie and we just got another question come in um, when building models, do you use any specific software such as R or um, anything else? Uh, yeah, so I uh, when I build machine learning models, I well now my latest passion is Python. 
I, I've been using R for the last 10 years now, and I've done a lot of machine learning in R too, but I think Python, especially scikit-learn, uh, which is the one I've used, is it's extremely efficient and uh, very well documented, very well structured. So uh, if you know your way around R, there's nothing stopping you from, uh, from learning Python. Actually, I can't say I, I know Python. I don't know Python. I know scikit-learn, which also uh, means that you don't necessarily have to know the language inside out to, uh, to, to use a package that you think is going to be helpful for, uh, for your work. Fantastic. And just another question come in just now. Um, the, the cost of misclassification is interesting. What, in your opinion, is the difference between the cost of misclassifying feedback as compared to the cost of nobody reading it at all? I would say uh, involve the managers to give you this cost. <laughs> I, personally, I don't know what this cost is. It could be a lot. It could be, you know, trivial. It could be average. I really don't know. That's that's where you have uh, non-technical people, but who who would are more engaged with this kind of, uh, you know, of uh, say um, concepts of of losing or gaining from something to to mm -hmm. guide you. So so I wouldn't do it myself. I would have people involved in it to 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 give me uh, different values to you know propose me different values that I would try. Uh, and before finishing, sorry, I just wanted to mention if, uh, the previous question. Uh, if you go for a machine learning solution in R, uh, I would recommend uh, MLR3. Tidy models is also pretty popular, but MLR3 is my favorite. Brilliant. Thank you, Andreas. Um, a question for Laurie. Um, do you have advice for people who are not in provider situations for interacting with clinicians where any access isn't guaranteed? I mean, that is difficult where it's not guaranteed, but I think you will always find someone that's curious. And I mean, I, I experienced some of this because when I work, obviously, I said we're the mental health trust. And I have to find people in the acute trust to talk data with me. And if I'm honest, I tend to Google it and just start emailing people and see what I get back. So if you find it, find it even through Google, you, you can find email addresses and most people will point you in the right direction to give you a bit of an insight into the team. And so it's a bit hit and miss and you've got to be a bit mindful of the data protection thing but most of it is just asking and pre-pandemic I remember calling Sherwood Forest Hospital's switchboard and going I want to talk to someone that does data anyone and I got quite far with it so that's often a good thing and people are often quite excited to talk about it and I think that I'm hoping that answered the question a little bit I think the other bit to engage people is that people like to correct you sometimes more than offer all the information. So if you've got someone like that, then you go, look, this is my understanding of your team so far. Could you tell me if it's correct? You can get potentially much further than just the open ended question of who are you? What do you do? So that's my other advice for trying to contact people that you may not know as well. Yeah, and I think uh, it's very helpful. Thank you, Laurie. Uh, Scott actually commented as well that he would recommend seeking out a clinical champion. And I would also highlight that in the LHSR community, we have quite a lot of clinicians uh, who do coding, uh, as Laurie and Andres, you might be aware. So yes, if you want to find clinician just to clarify that you think your analysis uh, has some meaningful messages, then yeah, it's definitely worth shouting on Slack, for example, especially if there are clinicians in the area. Sorry, back to you, Beth, now. No, that's great. Thanks, Anastasia. Um, and another question, um, what processes would be required to place these systems in the organisation? Sorry, was that a question for me? Uh, yeah, Ethan, if uh, you wanted to just share any experience you have. Sorry, can you, can you repeat the question? Yeah, and um, what processes would be required to place the systems in the organisations? to place the systems in organizations, I'm not sure I understand the question, to be honest. But I don't know what what the what the person who asked the question mean by by means by systems. So uh, 
I'm sorry, but if they can get in touch with me on Slack or uh, uh, yeah, via email, I can give them the answer they they are looking for. Oh, that's fair. Thank you. Thanks, Andreas. Um, and um, we do have a question about Python courses, and if there's any um, recommended ones that would be relevant to this. That's a very good question, and uh, I might say that I didn't I didn't watch any Python courses. Uh, it's just you know knowing how to build pipelines in R. Uh, I just did the same in Python. You know I would just copy mm. and paste what people would do, and uh, and uh, you know after lots of lots of errors and uh, banging my head against the wall, I managed to get it running. So I'm <laughs> so, I'm sorry, but I haven't I haven't uh, watched a single Python course. <laughs> <laughs> No, that's fine. And um, again, our Slack channel is um, very active, and I'm sure there'll be someone who will be happy to recommend uh, a course that you might find helpful. Um, and uh, I think I have a final question here. How do you both deal with situations where the person requesting the data wants the correct answer, i.e., their opinion? Yeah, this this can definitely be a problem, and I'll try and work out how to drop the link because I did write a blog post about this a little while ago. And sometimes it depends on what's going on, because this is something that I've encountered and sometimes you do need to stand your ground. It can be kind of scary, but at the end of the day, the data and sometimes the data being wrong, i.e. not matching their opinion as they're looking at it, can just mean that the variables you're looking at may not be showing what you think they're showing. So again, we had one recently about length of contact and actually again, it was all to, it all came down to misinterpretation as to when did a contact start and end and some people were saying it's when you stop being physically with the patient and others said it is when you have finished your paperwork that associated with seeing that patient. So sometimes it is about digging down and digging down and sometimes unfortunately the data will be wrong, the team will not be performing how whoever it is is asking is asking and it's just about being really clear with what you've done and then putting it back but I think most of the times the reason that the answer isn't correct as they're expecting it is all to do with the misunderstanding as to what they're collecting or, and what their team is doing or what actually exists in the data. Yeah I think I fully agree with uh, Laurie so it feels it feels like a, a competency question I feel like we're being interviewed Laurie but I think you give a, <laughs> yeah. I think I, I think you're, you give a very good answer so uh, I, I don't think I have anything uh, else to add thanks. I've tried to reply to the question with a blog post I did on this where I would sort of said about how the ideal situation is and then what happens when the two things don't add up and I built this analogy around that data is like the foundations of a house and when you get the data right there's not often much to look at you need the clinical context on top of it but what happens when you build the foundations for a six foot six foot house and they are, want you to build a mansion on top so I've, I've linked that that hopefully might also help people with insight later no, that's great. Thank you so much both. I think that, um, yeah, that sums up all of the um, questions that we had for this webinar, Anastasia.